thanks for helping me share this. And if you think of it, you can let me know what you did with your dollar bill. All right? Very good. Thanks for coming up. Good problem. I'm going to need to make sure I have enough $1 bills for the second service now, too. <laughs> Beloved people of God, grace and peace to you from Jesus the Christ. Amen. Well, the parable of the dishonest manager, as I mentioned at the beginning of the service, it's our gospel reading for today, remains one of the most difficult texts to interpret in all the Bible. For 2,000 years, biblical scholars and readers alike have struggled to make sense of it. One problem is the title of the parable. The Greek word, adikias, translated here as dishonest, appears 25 times in the New Testament. Only in this parable is it translated as dishonest. Dishonest puts a particular spin on the parable. It makes it seem like the manager's main problem is that he is a cheat with no integrity. Why would Jesus tell a parable commending someone for being a dishonest cheat? A more common translation of Atticus is unjust. It makes far more sense that Jesus would commend an unjust manager for trying to compensate for his unjust treatment of poor farmers. In the economic system of that time, managers would charge interest on money that the landlord had lent to the peasant farmers, uh, and the managers would then pocket a portion of, of that. Now, there were gross inequities in the system, but you can imagine the poor farmers were reluctant to can't, uh, complain as long as they were able to eke out a living. Now, in the first verse of the parable, the translation, squandering his property, makes it sound like the tenant farmers were most upset by what the manager was doing with his boss's wealth. More likely is that they were upset with the lavish lifestyle of the manager. He was charging an exorbitant amount of interest on their debts and pocketing far more than his fair share and living high off the hog on the backs of their hard labor. They didn't expect him to live in poverty, but they resented how he flaunted his wealth. The way the manager was conducting business did not reflect well on the rich, rich man, the, the rich landlord. Finally, these farmers could not take it anymore, and they complained to their landlord. It already was an unjust economic system, and the manager, in his greed, agreed, had gone to the extreme in using the system for his own benefit. Understandably, the landlord no longer wanted this manager representing him. He summoned him and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management because you cannot be my manager any longer. The landlord's summons proved to be what we might call a come to Jesus moment for the manager. He said to himself, what will I do? Now that my master is taking the position away from me, I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. Now, he knew his lavish lifestyle was history, but he also realized that he did not have what it takes to beg and to eke out a living. He had grown soft, and his pride would get in the way of do doing whatever it takes to survive. In that moment, it finally dawned on the manager just what life was like for these tenant farmers. He became aware of just how interconnected his well-being was with their well-being. They were no longer simply people to be taken advantage of. They were people on whom his life depended. Now, like so many of us, Carolyn Mackey, a PhD candidate at the uh, Toronto School of Theology, was confused by this parable, she says, as she grew up in the church. It was a parable, she explained, that I filed away on the confusing words of Jesus folder. <laughs> but, she says, this parable started to make a little more sense to me when I spent a few months in Senegal, West Africa, as a college student. Many people in my new neighborhood experienced more poverty than anyone I knew back home. 
but they were wealthy in social relationships, maintaining vast networks that were wider than the most well-connected people I knew back in Canada. During my time in Senegal, I learned that among other benefits, these social networks provided a financial safety net. Saving for the future in this context was less about personal savings accounts and more about helping out a friend, certain that they would return the help when it was needed." Unquote. Now, the manager in our parable may have been rich in material wealth, but he was poor in social relationships. He's all alone. Confronted by his master, having lost his position as manager, he had the wisdom in that moment to find a way to use his wealth to make friends with those he had treated unjustly. What he lacked was his social network of friends who cared enough about him that they would welcome him into their lives and homes. In reducing their debts, he was not stealing money from the landlord. He was giving back the exorbitant interest he had tacked on to their loans. The landlord would never have commended him for giving away the landlord's share of the money. In verse 8, it says that the master commended the manager for acting shrewdly. Shrewd doesn't quite seem like the right word here. The manager acted wisely or insightfully. Even though he had lived such a self-indulgent lifestyle, perhaps even that moment his heart went out to those he sought to befriend. Now, if the manager in this parable were simply a dishonest cheat, it would be less likely that we would be, feel convicted by this teaching of Jesus, this parable. But an unjust manager who has taken advantage of the poor, that hits closer to home in our society in which so many of us are well off. Many of us are part of the baby boomer generation. The baby boomers may well go down as the most self-indulgent generation in history. Once again, Carolyn Mackey writes, I sometimes wonder if it is only in a modern Western capitalist economy that Jesus' parable doesn't seem to make sense, that his words strike us so strangely. And for this reason, maybe we are the ones who need to hear it most. Perhaps we are the ones who most need the reminder that money and our use of it is always inherently social. Buying, selling, lending, investing, all of it part of making and maintaining the social fabric that we share with others for better or for worse." Unquote. Now, to be fair, this propensity to be enamored with wealth is not unique to our society or culture. About 500 years ago, Martin Luther warned Many a person thinks he has God and everything he needs when he has money and property. In them he trusts and of them he boasts so stubbornly and securely that he cares for no one. Surely such a man also has a God, mammon by name, that is money and possessions, on which he fixes his whole heart. It is, says Luther, the most common idol on earth. Now the first commandment is you shall have no other gods before me. Luther taught that our God is whatever our heart clings to. Until the unjust manager was called to account, it is clear that his God was wealth. He acted as if his life and security depended on accumulating as much wealth as possible. The parable of the unjust manager confronts us with the question of what constitutes the faithful use of wealth. What is Jesus teaching us about faithfully using our wealth? So, three thoughts. First of all, our use of wealth is to be grounded in our relationship to God. Cultivating our relationship with God will shape how we use our wealth. It's so easy to get caught up in the pursuit of money and possessions. It is one thing to be prudent in securing the wealth we need to sustain our lives. It's another thing to be consumed by accumulating uh, material wealth. As our gospel reading concludes, you cannot serve God and wealth. For people of faith, our top priority is serving God with all that we have. And now ultimately we recognize that all we have is a trust from God. We pray that we will be faithful in using that with which God has entrusted us. Secondly, 
People of faith will recognize how interconnected our well-being is with the well-being of other human beings and will use their wealth accordingly. We especially need to be reminded of how connected we are with those in the greatest need. It has been said that how a society treats its most vulnerable is always the measure of its humanity. How a society treats its most vulnerable is always the measure of its humanity. In our society, there are people in an enormous amount of wealth. They are in a position to give major financial gifts to help others. Now, in our day and age, we're becoming more and more aware of just how interconnected we are, not only with human beings, but also with the whole Earth community and all its inhabitants. Just this week, it was announced that Yvonne Chouinard, the founder of Patagonia, had given his company away in an effort to fight climate change. Now, none of us may be billionaires like the Patagonia founder, but even the 99 percenters have daily opportunities to use our wealth in faithful, insightful ways. As we read in Luke 16, 10, whoever is faithful in a very little is faithful also in much. A number of years ago, at a Vision Action Network luncheon, here in Washington County, I came across a little book entitled The Better World Shopping Guide. The Better World Shopping Guide. The subtitle is Every Dollar Makes a Difference. It guides you in making decisions about how much to spend, what to buy, who to buy from, and so on. Finally, the faithful use of wealth is not a matter of perfection. At times, people of faith, as people of faith, we can let ourselves be lured into the trap of trying to stay above the fray in a futile attempt to avoid the messiness of life. The unjust manager was in a serious mess with no easy way out. He had to find an insightful way to use his wealth to make friends with his accusers. The faithful use of wealth is all about weighing options, none of which may be ideal, and then deciding which one to pursue. We can learn from our decisions, but in some cases, we may never know for sure whether we made the right decision. We hope that the way we use our wealth truly does provide for our well-being and the well-being of all our friends, both human and non-human. In the end, God will be the ultimate judge of the way we have used our wealth. The good news is that the God who judges us loves us dearly. God will not stop loving us even as God judges us and seeks to lead and guide us in faithfully using our wealth. In Jesus' name, amen.